Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for the introduction. And indeed, thank you very much indeed for the invitation to join with you today for this discussion in an area I must say that I find very interesting, and I hope that I can convey some of my interest and enthusiasm during our discussion this morning. Energy, energy is everywhere and nowhere. You can't see it, feel it, or touch it, but it's everywhere. And our modern society depends on it. And to a large extent, we, certainly in the European Union and in Ireland, have the luxury to ignore it, because we have it all of the time. I'm sure you would have to think very hard to remember the last time that when you turned on a light switch, it didn't come on, except of course when the light bulb had blown, but certainly not for lack of electricity. And when we look at electricity, there's three issues that we're trying to achieve. First, and perhaps the most important issue for us as consumers, as citizens, and indeed as an economy, we want affordable energy. We want affordable energy for ourselves and we want affordable energy for our industry. We also want energy to be there. So we want secure energy. So we want to know that it's going to be there when we need it. And we're fortunate perhaps in, your, in, in Ireland that we're a long way from Russia, who on occasions just turns off the gas pipe and you just run out of gas. And of course our third issue with energy is we want it to be sustainable. We want to do our bit for the climate and we want our energy to be sustainable. And that means we have to look at energy from the perspective of where do we use energy. And many people find it a surprise that 50% or almost 50% of the energy we use is actually used for heating and cooling. Less so in Ireland, obviously, but heating and cooling is 50% of our energy consumption. And it's the place we need to start. And in that context, our first port of call would be our buildings. And I have to say, this is a very nice hotel. It's in a beautiful location. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of lights on today. And it's very likely, and I see a lot of people already have it, we'll all be taking our jackets off before too long because it's going to get very hot. And maybe we'll open the windows to cool it down, which is a very efficient use of energy because we're using energy to heat it, and then we're going to put it outside the windows. This is not a criticism of this hotel. I'm just saying that this is what tends to happen. So, the first area we need to think about is our buildings. And in Ireland, we have looked at uh, what are the things we're doing from a policy perspective in Ireland to do something about our buildings. So there are some areas where Ireland really is doing a super job. And I, I can say, having worked in, in Brussels, that for the first two areas here, Ireland would be a leader in a European context. So what we do with our energy rating, both for rental and for selling properties, and what we do for our new buildings here in Ireland, we are very much to the fore uh, uh, within the European Union. It gets a little bit less positive as you go down the list, as you can see. And perhaps the one I would highlight more than anything is the requirements for renovated buildings. And why do I focus on that? I focus on that because that's where we can make a huge difference. When you take an older building and you renovate it, you can have a dramatic impact on the energy efficiency of the building, but more importantly, you can have a dramatic impact on your pocket because you can save quite a considerable amount of money. And even though it's difficult to cost this, you can also improve your well-being and health. I don't have to tell you that if you sit in a room with leaky windows and drafts coming in, what the consequences are, versus sitting in a room that is comfortable, warm, and doesn't have any drafts. And that's really where the challenge exists in Ireland. Our housing stock in Ireland is old. 88% uh, of the houses in Ireland were built before energy efficiency requirements were introduced. And you, the, the dotted line is uh, the share of the total building stock. So you can see that most of it happened before the 2005-2009 introduction of energy efficiency requirements. And that's the big challenge in Ireland, is to access those properties, those houses that were built before energy efficiency standards came in, and retrofit those. And there, there are a number of issues in place today, but they could be better. The first issue is that for the most part, when you're talking about your own home, the privately owned property sector in Ireland, which is very large, it's about 
There are two times when you tend to retrofit your home. The first is, of course, when you were lucky enough to buy it and you managed to get the mortgage and you say, oh my God, how could somebody have lived here for the last 20 years? I really need to change the kitchen, the bathroom, etc." So there's energy and enthusiasm to do the house at that point in time. And of course, you're buying it for perhaps 20 or 30 years. So you have a long term perspective on your investment. But given mortgages here and the debt to credit ratios that exist, and the fact that energy efficiency is not considered to be part of the asset class of the banking sector, it's very hard to have a built-in part to the mortgage that can be used to retrofit the building and reduce the energy costs, which of course will allow the mortgage to be paid that much more easily going forward. That's a, a real challenge and one that has been looked at in a number of European countries and some s solutions have been identified, for example, in Germany using the KFW system. The second area is pre-retirement. And you might smile a little bit at that, but a lot of people kind of take the view, you know, we're going to be in the house, we're going to be in the house longer, uh, I want to be warm, I want to get it done now, I still have a few years left before I retire, and I'm going to make the investment now. And releasing the equity out of the building in order to do energy efficiency is a concept that's quite novel in Ireland. There is no risk from a bank's perspective. I cannot see any risk at all. And yet, the mortgage model doesn't exist in Ireland and is one that really could be brought in and facilitate enormously the support to individuals in order to retrofit their homes. So the first issue, as you know, Eliza said to Henry, if there's a hole in the bucket, Henry, fix it, dear Henry. So the first thing we do is we fix the hole in the bucket and we secure the envelope of our building with insulation and double glazing and all the other things that go with it. But that of itself is not enough. We then have to look at how do we heat our systems. And in Ireland, we are conspicuous at coming at the bottom of the list in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions from our square metre of built uh, houses. And the reason for that is quite clear. It's a simple reason. It's because we have 39% of our homes in Ireland that use oil for heating. And oil is very hard on the climate. It is the fuel that emits the maximum amount of uh, emissions and it is the reason why we find ourselves at the bottom of that list. It's a challenge, however, and this is a little bit difficult to see, but this is an excellent analysis that was done by the CSO earlier this year, and it ad identifies what the heating system in Ireland is by county. And this will not surprise you to, when you find that oil heating is primarily used outside of the urban spaces. It's kind of a no-brainer. You didn't even need CSO to tell you that. But it means that that's where the challenge is in terms of trying to retrofit the heating system in our homes in Ireland. And it is important in that context that when we actually work on doing something for the heating in our home, that we do it in the right way. And this is a, a, just an extract of what the energy rating system is for heating systems. And you'll find at you know, A++, combined renewables, at A++ heat pumps, and then A++ is ca gas cogeneration. And then you come down to number four, which is condensing gas boiler for, uh, and condensing oil boiler. And it is at level four that you will get a grant in Ireland. You will not get a grant for levels one, two, or three, but you'll get a grant for level four for a fossil fuel boiler to be replaced. I put some emphasis on it because it's something I frequently discussed with the colleagues when I was working in Brussels, and it really is an issue which makes Ireland an outlier by comparison to other countries in the European Union. One of the areas that ultimately the, trend, the, tr the transition into the decarbonised economy means that we will move out of fossil fuels into using electricity. And that means using electricity for heat as well as transport. Now, I see in the audience some people might be of an age not dissimilar to my own, and I can remember my father giving me a clip in the ear for turning on the, the one bar electric heater in the morning to try and heat myself getting dressed before going to school because at the time it was very expensive. 
And as a consequence, I grew up with this notion that electric heating is not such a good idea. And it is true that the one bar electric heating is very expensive and it's not the way to go. But the modern system for heating is totally different. It moves us into the space of heat pumps. And with a heat pump, one unit of energy, electricity, gives you three or four units of heat. And the simplest way to explain that is, if you ever stood behind your fridge, it's very hot, isn't it? That's a heat pump. It effectively takes cold air and sends out hot air. And that technology has now become available. It's widely used in Europe. It's the predominant technology in Scandinavia. And it is a decarbonized technology as our electricity system decarbonizes. And it means that as we move forward in this process, we will have to look to electricity as the carrier more and more for both heating and transport. And that means we have to focus a little bit on our electricity system. And in Ireland today, we have about 26% of our electricity coming from renewables, a mixture of wind, hydro, uh, some biomass in that space. I know that there has been a lot of discussion in Ireland about wind, particularly onshore wind, but I just want to share with you some of the reasons why Ireland is pursuing a policy of wind. This is an atlas that shows you where is the resource. And you can see that Ireland has the highest, along with the UK, the highest resource for off onshore wind. If I go to offshore wind, even more so. It is the resource that we have available to us for this transition. Ireland didn't have coal and steel for the last industrial revolution, and it passed us by. We have the energy resource for this one, and the question is, can we use it, and can we get the best benefit from it? I mention also solar energy, because solar energy is a really important addition along with wind, and I'll explain why in a moment. But I just want to make a case in terms of what it costs for these technologies and how much the costs have come down over the last little while. And you can see that all of the costs have come down dramatically, really, really dramatically in the last little while, which makes these technologies very cost competitive. And indeed, onshore wind today for new build is the cheapest that you can get anywhere in the world. So there are reasons, there are economic reasons for your pocket and mine why Ireland should use wind as its source. It's free to us, it's clean, and we have the most resource of any country in Europe here in Ireland. I just want to take a moment to talk about the electricity system. This is how much electricity we use on an average day. So you can see that you know, the kids are up late at night at midnight, and then by 4 o'clock virtually everybody's in bed, and our consumption goes down. It gradually increases to the point where we get to lunchtime. We have a dip in the middle of the afternoon. Ironically enough, one of the reasons for that is because school finishes. And when school finishes, the energy, electricity consumption goes down. It then goes back up as we go home. We have something to eat. We sit down, we watch television, and gradually go to bed. That's an average day for electricity com consumption in Ireland. And the red line right up at the top is what the electricity system must build for. So you take the highest point, you add 20%, and you must build for that, because you never know when you're at the peak, the World Cup is on, there are going to penalties, you have five minutes to make a cup of tea, and everybody goes and switches the kettle on. So you always have to have a margin of about 20%. But imagine if we could identify these two peaks and move them down into the hollow. And look what happens in terms of the red bar. Look what we could save in terms of our system. And that possibility exists today. That exists with the new technologies coming from renewable energy and the new technologies coming from information and communication possibilities. We have the possibility for distributed generation. Nothing stops you putting 
a PV panel, a photovoltaic panel on your roof to generate electricity. You can use it yourself and you can supply it to the grid. This is the norm in European U Union countries. In Germany, 7.5% of their electricity comes from PV panels. And 40% of those panels are owned by individuals, 20% by farmers. It's not possible in Ireland today, because if you do that, you give away the electricity to the grid for free. We don't have any tariff available. The second issue is storage. Sorry. Storage. And it's not to say that storage is the be-all and end-all, but it will become so when we have electric vehicles because we will have batteries everywhere because they'll be in the cars and they will provide a storage system to our electricity grid. Energy efficiency, I've already mentioned, is one that we can do. We can stop the leaky, uh, the hole in our bucket. And th another area that's becoming very popular and being used in Europe is what we call demand response. This is taking the time at which we use electricity and moving it. I mean, the simple example is you put your washing machine on, or better still, you program your washing machine to come on in the middle of the night. Or you decide that you're going to heat your water in the middle of the night and your immersion is sufficiently insulated that the water will stay hot for your shower in the morning. So you program all of this using your smart meter and you shift your energy consumption to the time when it is cheapest. But that needs two things. It needs one, that you have a smart meter. And you will have heard in the last week or so that smart meters now, eventually, will be rolled out in Ireland over the next five years. But we are almost five years in arrears of other European countries in this rollout. And secondly, your supplier needs to offer you a time of use tariff. Not a day tariff, a night tariff, but a time of use tariff. Because when there's lots of wind, price of electricity drops almost to zero. And indeed, it can go negative in some countries. It has done in other countries in Europe. So the opportunity to get really cheap electricity needs to be made available to you by your supplier on the one hand. And secondly, you can capture it through your smart meter on the other hand. And these are the kinds of changes that are happening in our electricity system that will make the electrification of heating and ultimately transport not only possible, but very economic for us as individuals. I'm not going to deal with the smart home because I know Brian is going to do it in more depth. I just want to do one or two slides as to where Ireland is vis-a-vis -vis other countries in Europe for the renewable energy targets for 2020. A little bit difficult to see, but in essence, the target is the red line. And 11 member states have already reached their target. then the blue line is the one that is still to be achieved. And you can see from that that Ireland finds itself in a box with Malta, Luxembourg and the Netherlands as member states who are unlikely to achieve the renewables target by 2020. Which is a pity, given that we have the greatest wind resource in Europe it seems unfortunate. Specifically, the targets in Ireland of heating, which was 46% of our energy, our target was 12% and we're currently at 6.4. For transport, the target was 10 and we're at 5.9. And for electricity, the target was 40% and we're currently at 27%. And this is, 19, this is 2017. We have about two and a half years be generous, call it three and a half years, to get to 2020. So it is an upward trajectory to try and achieve our own target by 2020 and to set us in the right direction in terms of going forward for uh, what might confront us going forward for 2020, 2030, 2050. And certainly, if Ireland is to be a leader in climate change, it would be important that we can demonstrate in our own home market what it is you can do and how you can do it. Thank you very much indeed for your intention.